All right, so today we are going to head back into factoring with a little bit of a review of how we've done this before, and then we're going to add a couple of new factoring techniques to what we have been doing. So what I'm going to mention first, I know there's four types there, but we have kind of a step zero to this. It kind of works before any of these. And that is what we are going to continue to call the golden rule. And again, the golden rule is, can I factor something out before I even start trying to do anything else? The easiest way to see that here at the start is down here in number four. When I look at the example, 6x squared plus 15x, I have to ask myself, okay, is there something those two terms have in common that I can pull out? 3, anything else? X. Now, that's not all I'm trying to do. I'm just trying to rewrite this in a different way in case I'm trying to solve or something like that. So that 3x is on the outside. What do I multiply 3x by to get to 6x squared? 2x. That's right, plus 5, because 3 times 5 is 15, and I already have my x. This would be one of the simpler forms that we deal with. If we get fortunate enough that all we got to do is take out a common factor. But it gets bigger than that. So then let's say we go back up to a one like number 2. I notice there's not a number that comes out of all three of these. I know I could divide a 5 out of each of these, but I can't take that out of x squared. Nothing to take out in common. So I would assume quite a few of you, even though there's another shortcut here, I'd assume that many of you are going to look at this and say, okay, I'll do like a diamond on it. So what multiplies to 25 but adds up to 10? 5 and 5. But if I'm really on my A game, I could look at this and say, wait a minute, those are both perfect squares. I can just write down each of the terms x squared, 5 squared is 25, and pop a squared on it. They're both completely correct, but sometimes when it comes to solving again, this is going to be a little easier to work with. But again, that's also assuming you know your perfect squares. And I'm going to say this just like we said when we were doing the factoring before. When we're doing the perfect squares, you have to, have to, have to know your squares at least, at least to 10, preferably to 15. Because when you're looking at these problems, if you don't recognize the number's a perfect square, it's kind of hard to use some of the shortcuts and some of the rules we're going to be talking about, especially the next example we're going to speak of. So that's one of those you've got to get used to them just so you can see them and recognize them. Because then when you get a difference of squares, difference again being minus, let me mention one thing before we factor this. When you're dealing with squares, there's a difference. There is no such thing as a sum of squares. In other words, if you see 4x squared plus 9, we're not going to factor that because we'd have to use imaginary numbers. And right now, we just don't need to do that. So for the time being, if it's minus with squares, we're going to deal with that. And we're going to make that work. So if I'm looking for my difference of squares, it's a little bit of common sense. What do I square to get 4x squared? 2x. And what do we square to get 9? 3. And we know since we're multiplying to get to negative 9, 1's plus and 1 is minus. And we're done. And then finally comes the one that might take a little longer. Now again, some of you are very good at looking at problems like this and saying, okay, these have to multiply to 2 and 1, so I really don't have a lot of options. Over here, though, I do have options. It could be 2 and 6. It could be 4 and 3. It could be 12 and 1. I don't know. Well, we've got to start playing with it. But the things I do know, I know one's going to be positive and one's going to be negative because of the negative product. I know the larger of my two products is going to be negative. So when I add them together, I get a negative number. Anybody know what the combo is yet? 
Yep, the four and the three is going to work. And I'm going to be ready to go. Now, that's the fast way. And I'm trying to remember, I don't think I've even taught you guys this other method before, but I have enough people, and maybe this is me coming from regular Algebra 2 to you guys, that have trouble factoring that I'm going to show you this on one problem. And if you need to see this in a bigger form, I'll, I'll get you a bigger sheet later. I've never taught you guys slide and divide, right? Okay. If you're getting into a problem you're trying to factor, and just running through all those numbers through your head isn't, isn't clicking for you, here's your backup plan. There are teachers in this department that don't like me when I teach this, but I still think it teaches number sense, so I'm going to keep doing it anyway. Slide and divide works like this. I'm going to take whatever my coefficient is in front, and I'll work it to the end. So I rewrite this, 2 times negative 12 is negative 24. Now I'm going to treat it like I would any old diamond problem, any old simple one of these. And I'd say, okay, what multiplies to negative 24 and adds to negative 5? Well, negative 8 and 3 do. You're like, okay, I don't see where this is going, but I'll work with you. Here's the part that kind of gets interesting or cool. The divide part of this, to get me to the answer, Whatever value I slid down before, I now am going to divide the number part by. If it goes in evenly, great. If it doesn't, I reduce the fraction as far as I can, and then I slide the denominator back to the front. I get the same answer. So if sometimes you get into big numbers and you just it's not clicking, you can't figure out what the combo is, this can at least get it to where you're only having to deal with a diamond, as long as you remember the divide part at the end. Because my Algebra 2's have a little problem, they like to slide, but they forget the divide part. Just something to think about. Okay, so that's the stuff we were doing before though. Now we're going to start adding a couple of things. So let me move this up a bit. Oh wait a minute, I want my little box to show up here still. Okay, with sum and difference of cubes, these things right here. That's my nice way of putting, you must memorize these. Must, must, must. Because if you don't know the pattern, there's not another way around it. So, and also notice with cubes, there's a sum and difference. I can do both. The only difference is going to be the signs in the middle. So here's how these go. I'll really break it down in the first couple, and then we'll start whipping through them a little faster here. When I see a sum of cubes, or a difference, what I'm basically going to do is, I'm going to ask myself, what do I cube to get each one? You're like, wait a minute, cubes, uh-oh. Okay, cubes, yeah, we need to know these two. I always tell people, if you know your cubes, let's say through five even, we'll occasionally get a bigger one, but not very often. So when I can recognize what I cube to get each one. The only thing I need to know with the pattern then is, my first job is to just put the two terms together with whatever sign they started with. So it's plus, so I start with plus. I'm gonna square my first term. Then I'm gonna have minus. Now here's the other thing I want you to notice. Whatever sign you start with, the next sign you have is gonna be the opposite. If I start with plus, then it goes minus. If I start minus, then it goes plus, and that's every time. These signs will never change, never change. Multiply these together, 2x, square my last term. So it's square the first, times them together, square the last. If I was stepping them on the floor, it'd be a dance step, but I'm not gonna even attempt that because that would get ugly for me. Uh, would the last sign always be plus? Yes. Yep, that last sign too. All those signs are always going to be the same. Because even if I tried to put a minus in here, which I won't, because and I'll explain in the next one, my second term here isn't going to be negative one, it's going to be one. That I won't have to worry about that. And the only difference between these, besides the fact that the numbers are different, is going to be with that minus. So here, my first term would be 2x, because 2 cubed is 8 x cubed and 1. And you notice, oh, just copy them, 
put the minus in the middle that the original problem started with. When you square your first term, you're squaring the whole thing, the 2 and the x. So that's where the 4x squared is coming from. My sign switches, multiply them together, and then square my last term. The nice thing with sum and difference of cubes is once you're done with it, it'll never break down further. That's just the end. You're done. And we go from there. So I think it would be appropriate. To, oh, yes, ma'am. just one because the minus that I'm using here is just telling me the signs that are going to be in here okay. because if I do it with negative one that would change this to a minus 2x and that would make life difficult okay. uh-huh and sometime if you weren't sure not that this is something we want to do on every problem you can always take what you get for your answer and distribute and multiply this out and it'll get you back to the original problem okay. so that's a way you could double check that too so when we get down here, I want to take a peek. Well, we're going to start with 1, 2, and 5, and then we'll go from there. So on number 1, again, whatever you cube to get each of those terms, and no, you don't have to write every single thing out like I do, but I like doing this just so I can see the different parts and they kind of jump at me. So I'm going to have my x and my 3, steal the sign that they have there. So the first set of parentheses, that's the easy part. Now it's my second quantity that I have to do a little more work with. Again, I'm going to square my first term, change the sign, take the product of my two terms, and add the square of my last term. And I'm done. And I know it seems shocking to think that if you literally multiplied this out, you'd get back to the original but you do, and you can check me on it if you need to. But that's basically all we're doing with any of these. It's just, what do I cube? I cube 3 to get 27, I cube x to get x cubed. I cube 1 to get 1, I like 1, simple number to work with. And then I just use that Write down my terms, deal the sign in the middle. And then I just run the process. Square my whole first term, including the 3. Change the sign. Take the product of my two terms. And add the square of my last term. Are they always going to be that direct? No. And that's the thing that where you're going to kind of become detectives with this. Because not only are you going to have to know these forms, but there's going to be little twists that are going to try and throw you off. Like number two. Number two, number one thing we're checking out is the golden rule. Do those two terms have anything in common? A two, okay. Anything with variable terms? Yeah. Whenever I'm dealing with finding the greatest common factor, the two things to remember. Number one, I want the largest number or the largest coefficient that goes into both. And secondly, if all of your terms have variables, you want to use the one that has the smallest exponent. Now, if they don't all have variables, I can't even take a variable. But if they do, that's what I want to take out. So u squared would absolutely be the way to go. So, okay. So I take out the 2u squared. What do I have to multiply it by to get back to my first term? Okay, 8u to the third. 2 times 8 is 16. Adding my exponents to get to there. I already got the u squared. 2 to get to, whoops, yeah, 2 to get to 250. 125. So just put a box around this. I'm done, right? What's that? Nope, because I'm 
I, I need to get to negative 250, so 2 times negative 125 and get me to negative 250. Yes, sir? Ding, ding. I come back up here. 8 and 125 are both perfect cubes, which is, again, why I need to know this so I don't stop. So here, I need to see what I cubed to get each of these so I can break this down again. So I'd have 2u, and I would have 5. So some of you are probably wondering at this point, well, what do I do with that 2u squared? It's still here, but I'm not doing anything new with it. So just like we've done on any of our other cube problems, I got the 2u and the 5. Keep the minus that's there already. And then I just run my pattern in my second quantity. Square my first term. Again, make sure you do it with the coefficient and the u. Change the sign. Multiply those guys together so the 2u and the 5 don't change the sign on me. And then square my last term. So sometimes you may not only get to do a sum or difference of cubes, you may also have to factor something out. Ew. I don't know about this stuff. There's... Here, I'm just taking the product of these two. No, that's okay. So yeah, just take the pri. And we're going to hit a couple more of these, but I want to show a couple of the other twists that we can get thrown in here too. So let's, oh, yes. Okay, so like what we're doing three, and that's the next one I was heading to here anyway. So you look at this, you're like, well, wait a minute. Now, 25 and 36, are they cubes or squares? Squares. So I'm sitting here going, okay, well, it could be a difference, but that's not squared, that's to the fourth. Okay, let me, let me answer that this way. Sometimes we have to take a different look at something before we can actually get to the solution here. If instead of 25x to the 4th is 25x squared. You're like, ooh, I get to start changing the questions? No. What would my answer look like if it were 25x squared minus 36? 5x minus 6, 5x plus 6. Here's the only difference in what we're going to do. That setup is going to be exactly the same Except before, x times x is x squared. What times what is x to the fourth? X squared. And I'm doing the exact same thing. Because they didn't have something in common for me to take out. Nothing goes into 25 and 36 evenly. They both didn't have a variable term. So then I kind of start running this list through my head. Okay, nothing in common. Ooh, they're perfect squares. Ooh, there's a difference. Ooh, I can do difference of squares. Now, I will warn you, if either of these then would have been a perfect square, like 4x squared minus 9, you may have to break it down again. That may happen sometime. Hmm, I wonder if it will. Somewhere in this lesson. But sometimes that's one of the twists we can have thrown our way. But that's going to show up again, too. The last new thing that comes in, and then we're just going to sort of kind of hammer away at some examples to make this a little easier to deal with. There are four termers. Okay, factoring by grouping, because here's kind of my checklist. When I'm factoring by grouping, I'm going to take each problem and I'm going to pair it off into two separate problems. <coughs> and normally you can just leave them in the same order they're in. So in that first quantity, that first pair of parentheses, <coughs> what do they have in common? x squared. So I'm going to pull out an x squared. What do I have left to put in my parentheses? x minus 2. Because x squared times x is x to the third. I already got my x squared. Get the minus 2 there. Now if I did this right, 
when I do the next one, I'm going to end up with the same value inside the parentheses. So, hmm, what do the next two have in common? Ooh, some of you guys caught that even right away. Negative 5. Now, I'll explain here too in a minute, if you just thought it was positive 5, how you'd find out you needed to tweak that a little bit. Because here, negative 5 times x is negative 5x. Negative 5 times negative 2 is 10. If I'd have pulled out a positive 5, I'd have had negative x and positive 2. It wouldn't have been quite right. The signs would have been flipped. And then we can just pull out a negative. But that's not the way we write the final answer. Your greatest common factors go together. They get grouped. And you only need to write the x minus 2 once. Don't put it twice. Don't put it as squared. Just write it once. Because again, if I were to FOIL this out, I get the original problem back. And that's what we're attempting to do here. We're attempting to get it into forms where if we were looking to solve, we could. But that's going to be the same with all of these. So kind of as we move our way down the sheet, let's say we're doing 8. I'll bounce around a little bit here. What's that first pair of terms have in common? X. Yeah, sometimes it may not be much. So let's see, I've got 2X and I've got 5. So if I do this right, the next set, when I get done, should be 2X plus 5. What's my 10X plus 25 have in common? 5. 2x plus 5. All right. And again, to get to the solution, ooh, I just saw something I think will be of interest to you. We're going to do a rewind here for a second. I'm going to go back to number 7. So I just saw something pop up in 7 that I think you'll be interested in. You're like, 7 looks just like the rest of them. Well, let's see. Number 7, first pair. What have we got in common? 2x squared. Uh, or x squared, excuse me. I got a little ahead of myself. So let's see, x squared, so I need the 2 and the x. And here I've already got the x squared, I just need the 3. Okay. What about my second set? Take out a negative. So we'll take a negative 1 out of there. We always have to take something. If you see nothing, you can always take 1. Or in this case, negative 1 to get my signs switched. Here comes the part that gets interesting if you're not paying attention. So I'm just going to put this together. And a lot of you would look at this, you'd put your box or your circle around it and you'd be done. Except you're not. What can I still do with this one? That should have bells sounding in your head. You're like, wait a minute, they're both perfect squares and it's a difference. I gotta break that down. Yes, you do. Occasionally this will happen. You're like, oh, difference of squares. So x times x is x squared. 1 times 1 is 1, and it's plus minus. It doesn't mean everything's going to change around. This still just stays the way it was. But you have to be more careful than ever with what you're doing to make sure that you break everything down. Or some of you will go crazy and like overbreak things down now. to find my nasty ones here. Speaking of nasty ones, let me flip. I'm not going to go nuts and do all of these, but I want to do a few more here just to make sure we're on the right track. Let's run across these three on the top, and then I think we should be pretty good, unless somebody finds another one that looks like fun. All right, 16x to the fourth minus 625. Holy moly. Anything going to both of those? I'll help you out. No. You're like, crap. So now what? What's 16? 
16 is a number, it's true. It's a perfect square, okay? So I look at that and I'm like, well, perfect squares, and it's a difference. Hmm, I wonder. And we just got done saying, oh yeah, this would be squared. 625 though, that's kind of getting me here. Let's see, oh hey, what a coincidence. Square root of 625 is 25. Okay, so since it's a difference of squares, it's plus and minus. So I'm like, okay, what was so bad about that besides the squared? Can I put the box around it yet? Nope, which one breaks down still? <laughs> <laughs> difference of squares no such thing as sum of squares let me come back and ask the question again do they both break down no which one does this one and only this one leave sums only work with cubes not squares but we can break this second guy down. What's he going to look like once we break him down? 2x plus 5 and 2x minus 5 in either order. Now we can box it. So again, be cautious. Please. All right. 11. Anything in common to pull out? 4x squared, okay? Largest coefficient that goes in, smallest exponent, good deal. So what is my quantity in the parentheses gonna look like? They're wanting to be loud enough so they can be heard. I know how this works. Okay, <laughs> so again, don't let the fourth throw you off. Treat it just as though this were x squared minus 5x plus 6. Factor it the exact same way. It's just going to be squared on my x this time instead. What multiplies to positive 6 but adds to negative 5? Okay. Negative 2 and negative 3. Now I'm good. If that would have been a 4 or a 9 or something like that's a perfect square, I'd have had to have done it again. But it wasn't, so I don't. So again, just keep reminding yourself on that stuff. Last one. I want to do one more cube. Because again, we look at this. And don't get sucked in. You're like, wait a minute, 64 is a square. Yes, it's a square and a cube, but in this case, we're using it as a cube. So don't write down 8x. And again, even though it's a minus in the middle, just do it as the cube. Just do it as the 3 for right now, because we'll deal with all the signs once we get into here. So we've got 4x minus 3. And again, just run the pattern. Square the first term, the 4 and the x. Change the sign. Multiply my two terms together. And add my last term squared. And that's basically what we're doing. Now here's the one thing I'll mention down at the bottom. The one thing, because I know I've done this on quizzes and stuff, and I keep circling the word solve all the time. When it says solve, I want to know what x equals in some cases. Now, does that mean that I have to factor it every single time? No, it doesn't. You're like, wait a minute, it doesn't? No. Because sometimes you may find it's harder if you factor. For instance, on 25, I could subtract the 27 to the other side and take the cubed root. You're like, wait a minute. What if I don't know that off the top of my head? Okay, that's not a problem. 
even though we know the cube root of 27 is 3, so I would hope we remember that part. But if you don't remember, here's your backup plan. I know some of you have a cubed root function on your calculator. That's even better. Otherwise, you can take anything to the one-third power when you're wanting to cube it. And get your answer. You're like, well, what if I did the factoring like we were just doing? Okay, you can. I could factor this, and it would look like this. But what you would have to watch out for is you'd set each of these equal to zero. Well, with the first one, that's no big deal. It's just negative three. I'm like, okay, that's good. This, though, a lot of the times isn't going to be factorable. You'd have to use the quadratic formula to check something to see if you have a solution or not. Ugh. Okay? You're better off most of the time doing it this way with the cubes. When it comes to the grouping ones, I completely disagree with myself. These, I would go ahead and factor. Let's see here. So I've got x squared minus and here's the other thing that you'll find out a lot of the time. You'll find out with some of yours that that degree is going to tell you basically how many answers you're going to get most of the time. Because sometimes you'll get imaginary answers. And I probably should be finding my imaginary answers here. So here, if I set this equal to zero, I'll do this one over here because there's less room. add my 5 and square root it Ooh. plus square root of 5 minus square root of 5, 4. Three answers. I have to be a good boy. I have to go back to number 25 now because i got to find my imaginary solutions that I didn't do. Yes, sir? Okay, you mean like going from here to here? Okay, so here, if I take the negative 5 out originally, when I distribute, I end up with negative 5x, which is what I had in the original problem, and negative 5 times negative 4, which is positive 20, which is what I have in the original problem. Okay, and then I do want to make sure I do this because I can't be mean about this. If it does not factor, what am I going to do? Yeah, I was going to say, can I write no solution? No. I'm going to do the quadratic formula. So negative b plus or minus. You're like, oh, i got to remember this still. Yes. b squared minus 4ac all over 2a, which in this case would be 1. So let's see. 3 plus or minus. That would be 9. So 9 minus 36, lovely. Uh-oh, you know it. wonder if any of them have seen this yet. What do I have to do with that negative I'm taking a square root of? Take an eye out. And break it down. Holy crap. One answer, two answers, three answers. Exponent tells you how many answers you better be finding. Some of you are like, holy crap, don't do number 30 then. I won't because we're going to be out of time, but I'll probably do it at the start of class tomorrow. So, with the reminder that tomorrow is going to be a work day, doesn't mean you completely blow this off and wait for me because I'm putting a worksheet on this too. Again, this is going to be homework check 11. The book work for today is assignment 3. Tomorrow I'll give you the worksheet. That will be number 4. And that's what we're taking a peek at.